Hello and welcome to the Villa Park Podcast. It's me, Rich, and I'm back with Kev for a special Bodymore Bulletin with uh, the man uh, at the pulse of the news across the Midlands and also Villa, uh, Mr. Tom Colomossi. We'll bring him in in a second. Uh, Kev, how are you doing, mate? Excited for this one? Absolutely, mate. Yeah, always good to uh, keep abreast of what's happening at Villa from someone who's maybe a tiny bit more in the know, I joke, than us. Um, I'm sure our uh, our viewers will be interested to know if there's any any news about to break, possibly without giving too much away. Exactly, exactly. But before we go, uh, just our usual stuff. Um, we are so so close to 2,200 subscribers on the way to 3k. So you'll be doing us a huge huge favor if you could like the the video and subscribe to the channel. It helps us bring a great guests on, like Tom himself and others, um, and helps us do wonderful things with the channel. We thank you all for your support. But yeah, please help us on the road to 3k. Uh, so without further ado, let's bring the man in himself, uh, Midlands football correspondent for the Daily Mail, uh, Mr. Tom Colomasi. How you doing, mate? I'm well, guys. How are you? Very well, very well. I think this is maybe your third or fourth uh, appearance right. on the Actually, Villa Park pod. So, friend of the channel, mate. Friend of the channel, part of the furniture. No, really glad to be back on. Good, good, good. So, yeah, I mean, we were just sort of talking backstage there about, um, you know, other clubs around, around the Midlands that have seemed to be in a little bit of turmoil. You know, obviously Leicester going down last season, you know, trying to rebuild Birmingham City, lots of stuff going on there and and Wolves, lots of stuff going there. I and mean, you, you sort of commented that Aston Villa are, are fairly stable at the moment and uh, and it's it's feeling like the club's going in the right direction. It certainly is. It must be a nice change for you guys as well after a, a decade of, you know, difficulty leading up to relegation then the period in the championship and then were they going to go out of business under Tony Shah and there's a couple of seasons of are you going to stay in the Premier League and then you know managerial changes that didn't quite work so I think I'm not a Villa fan but it seems as though this is the most positive supporters have been maybe since the kind of early days of Martin O'Neill would that be right yeah yeah 100% I mean me, myself and Kev on the on the podcast, like it's almost like dreamland, isn't it, Kev? Like at the minute, you know the way the way things are going with the seat, the finish to the season that we had, and the way that we were setting up for this season, isn't it? It it is. It's like Villa fans have been through such pain. I mean, and obviously, no no football fan base has got a divine right to success, of course. But based on what's happened over the history of Villa, you probably would have expected a bit more in the last twenty years. Although I'm, I'm kind of glad we didn't have Dr. Tony in charge when we, we, we were doing the channel. I'm sure you're the same, Tom, because you would have been a few sleep, sleepless nights. You have had yeah, that's right. I mean, I, I um, started this job the summer after they'd won promotion. So I was in another job when it was the Tony Shah era, but obviously you follow it from afar. And it really did seem that the lights were about to go out of Villa when they lost that playoff final to Fulham. Um, and you never want to see a club like Aston Villa in those kind of straights. I mean, we've had it on the patch with Derby as well, and a similar similar uh, rule applies to them. I mean, fans all have their rivalries, don't they? But ultimately, yeah. you don't want to see another club, or you shouldn't want another, to see another club sink without trace. So it's good that good times back at Villa Park. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. he, he used to announce transfers with with emojis as well, didn't he? He would have to like, well, you know those emo emoji calculators. You got to work out what, what does he mean. <laughs> <laughs> crazy times. Crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It would have been difficult. Now, on the, on on that feeling of kind of the 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 kind of transfer announcements and the the kind of focus that's on Villa at the moment, because I feel like they've almost with Emery, they've kind of gone up a level in terms of that media sort of focus, particularly this season. And also, there's been kind of backroom changes. What what have you kind of noticed in reporting about the club in terms of the general the general feeling and the the organisation structure around kind of Emery and and the backroom team? Yeah, it's an interesting one. That a couple of points to make. I think it's pretty clear that when Emery got the job, he did so from Nasef Sawiris. He drove that. 
and he took it on the basis that he would run the show. It's his train set. And we could see that in January, they signed Alex Moreno, very much an Emery signing. They're also looking at La Liga, looking at Spain. Um, and we've seen it even more since the end of the season with the changes at the back room. And you've got Christian Perslow, who's moved on. Um, Chris Hex now very much doing the commercial side. And Emery runs the show on the football side, really. Johan Langer is still there, but maybe not quite so involved with first team recruitment. Um, so it really is his club. Um, Monchi, of course, which I'm sure we'll come on to, has come in as the I think it's the role of uh, Damir Vidigani is very interesting and will become increasingly significant across the season. Um, you may have seen in press conferences last year that he was always sitting next to Emery. Um, I think initially that was because Emery was um, probably a bit sore about the way he was portrayed at Arsenal. You know, I think unfairly the mickey was taken out of his English, which I always think is, is pretty low blow. But when yeah. He- of trying to speak a foreign language and how many English people are good at speaking foreign languages I guess a yeah. fairly percentage um so um he wanted someone he trusted to be alongside him to make sure he was he was getting all that stuff right now I think Vidigani's role has become much more broader and more important since the end of the season um I think he's he's almost on a par with kind of you've got your Monchi Emery and Vidigani really running the show so um he's he's right across everything that's happening at Aston Villa yeah well we've heard you know the the kind of stories of Emery you know be these detailed kind of player meetings in 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 the office from like dawn until you know way past sort of eight nine ten o'clock at night just just completely dedicated to to the job and obviously that seems to be coming across in the way that he wants sort of control over everything that's right that's right and Monchi was very much his man. I think it might sound a bit controversial in such a kind of joyful time, but the jury has to be out on Monchi a little bit, I think. Most of his great work was done at, I mean, looks fantastic at what he does, but he built his reputation probably in the first decade of the 2000s and then going to after it with what he did at Sevilla. Danny Alves would be his kind of statement signing, um, but there were others, Freddie Canute and... Um, yeah. Ivan Rakitic, various other players that he brought to the club. Um, we had a bad time at Roma, which is his only time that he worked outside Villa. Now, Roma's a chaotic club, so maybe you can give him a bit of a free pass there. But um, when he left Sevilla, they didn't have they didn't have a great season in domestic football. The, the Europa League win covered a multitude of sins. Um, some not great deals made in the transfer market. Now, what you hope is that because everything's aligned at the top, or it seems aligned, um, he'll be able to work in the way he works and everything everything will, will run smoothly. But it only takes a couple of um, a couple of missteps for people to start getting cross with each other and say, oh, that was him and that was me. And you know, football people with big egos don't find it, you know, they find it pretty easy to fall out with each other. But, you know, hopefully, hopefully Villa's point of view, it will all run smoothly. Um, it seems that seems to be the case at the moment. Tom, do you think um, with obviously the opportunity Emery was presented with, the fan- chance to basically run the show. Um, do you think that means that if, say, a big club came in early on in, the, early on in this project, you know, I'm talking, you know, a year, year and a half in, a Barcelona, uh, you know, a, a Bayern Munich, a Real Madrid, do you think that means that Villa fans can be a bit more reassured that he's less likely to jump ship this early? Or do you still think that that's a big possibility for it to happen? I just don't think it works like that, does it? I think you go across the world of football, um, Aston Villa is a, is a really big club. I think it's not appreciated how big the club is, not only outside England, but maybe outside the Midlands. You know, it's a really big club. Yeah. Um, but it's not Real Madrid. It's not Barcelona. It's not Bayern Munich. I think those clubs, for anyone in football, whatever your job is, it's very hard to turn it down because you think, gosh, is that chance ever going to come again? And yeah. Emery is super motivated, super dedicated. You, just lives for the work, doesn't he? he? Lives for the job, yeah. and uh, you could imagine him absolutely beating himself up if he got to the end of his career and thought, "Oh, I never took Real Madrid," you know. Mm. So I don't think it was like they've 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 had to put this structure in place to get him. I think you know, that's how they got him. He's not going to come in and be with the greatest of respect, Dean Smith or Stephen Gerrard. This is Unai Emery, you know, multiple trophy winning manager, four times Europa League winner. So they had to put that structure in place to get him. But it doesn't mean that they can keep him if if one of the super super clubs comes along. 
No, I guess I was just thinking, um, I'm, clearly I've got rose tinted glasses. <laughs> <laughs> very, very rose tinted glasses. But obviously he didn't have the, the best of times at, at a PSG, didn't have the best times at Arsenal. He's traditionally done much better with the slightly more that's unfashionable true. clubs. Yeah, that's true. That's yeah. very true. But I think you can look at it two ways. Um, you can look at it that way, but then you look at it the other ways. I believe I am someone who can take charge yeah. of those. Those don't reflect how good I am, and, and here I am. I want to prove it. Hopefully, from Villa's point of view, that offer won't come, you know, when Ancelotti yeah. goes at the end of the season. I mean, traditionally, Real Madrid, they, they don't go for coaches like Emery that maybe go no. for you know, a figurehead type manager. Well, yeah, indeed. The, yeah. The, the ones that seem to work there much more. Are, are, I mean, Ancelotti is an absolute master of just tweaking here and there and a brilliant kind of man manager. I think he would be in any walk of life, actually. He's that sort of personality. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And it's worked so well for them that you could see, unless they have an absolute shocker of a season, you could see them trying to go in that direction again. Do you think, yeah. do you think that's, that's a bit of a risk for Villa then to have such power in, in Emery's hands and that system that if he if he was to leave, that could leave the club in a bit of a bit of a pickle. I mean, yeah, but I see where you're coming from. But I, I think also that um it's if you're gonna have a coach like that, you have to appreciate the risk involved, you know. Yeah. Um it there's various analogies you could draw, but it, it's you want if your coach is wanted by other people then your club's doing well you know yeah. um and i think there has to be a, a realism about with villa about where they are in the world um and if you lose your coach to real madrid all right um it might need a bit of a revamp behind the scenes but the basic thing will be in pretty good shape if He's real madrid well. wanted to take yeah. The coach. yeah 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 no no absolutely fair comment tom and we talk about kind of Emery and his influence. Um, maybe not so much Munches yet, but we'll, we'll come on to that maybe in, in terms of like potential incomings. But the signings that have been done so far, I, I would say like, you know, um, Pau Torres, uh, Musa Diaby, um, they're certainly ones that were targeted by Emery um, and, and, and Yuri Tielemans may be excited by the project. Uh, were, were those like, you know, specific Emery targets, um, I, I guess in the sense of Torres and Diaby, uh, or were maybe one or two of them more kind of opportunistic signings that we went, right, let's go for them? I think Tielemans was an opportunity because, you know, he's on a free. Um, and he's a good, I think he's a really good player. I think I watch a lot of him cover Leicester as well. Um, I know there's doubts about his pace, about his mobility. When the problem with Yuri Tielemans is, had a couple of bad injuries the last two seasons. Um, not real shockers, but, you know, six-week, two-month type injuries. Then the team needing maybe comes back too soon. Um, in his first two full seasons, he was among the, the best midfield in the country, I would say. And if they can restore him to that kind of level of fitness, he can, he can be a really effective signing for Villa. You know, I, I, I do really like him, um, especially on a free transfer. The other two... Um, I can't say I've seen loads and loads of them. You just see what you see on telly, which isn't a, a way to judge. Um, speaking to people in Spain, um, Pau Torres, perhaps a bit of doubt about him pace-wise and aerially. That's why it's been good. You know, if he's alongside a couple of speedier centre-backs in, in Mings and Concert, depending on how they're going to configure that back four. Um, but Diaby looks really exciting, doesn't he? You know, yeah. he's, the numbers in, in Germany for a, a kind of... Club with similar aspirations, I suppose, to Villa um, would would suggest that, you know, that'll be a good one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Villa fans certainly very excited uh, and DRB certainly started off, you know, really well in terms of that, that ruthlessness. Torres maybe needs a little bit of time to kind of acclimatise. I think that, like you've just said there, I think he might bring him into European games, you know, you know, should we do well in that playoff round? We're going to have a lot more games in that and then ease him into the Premier League. But I, I don't know if Kev would agree with this, but Tielemans looks like he's been part of the Villa midfield. This is based on pre-season, but looks like he's been part of the Villa midfield for for years. Oh, he's been he's been great. I know it's obviously only pre-season and teams maybe aren't up to speed, so maybe he's not being pressed as much as he might normally be in, in, in the cut and thrust of the Premier League. But... The, the confidence on the ball, the, the clear quality in terms of... I mean, the three ball he played to, to Watkins for the goal against Lazio in pre-season was just something that 
We've not seen too much of Dan Villa Park over the years. Passer. Real, real yeah. top yeah. yeah, we're, we're yeah. really excited, aren't we, about what he can add to that? That what, what is already really probably, and it's crazy for Villa fans to say this, but it, our our strongest area of the pitch is, is midfield. I would say now, and that, that, that. And I think if you watched a lot of um, when when Vardy was on song, um, what Tielemans gave you, you can pass short and pass long. If you watched Leicester with when they kind of played quickly through, you'd often get a Vardy spin run, Tielemans pass and hit the space. Mm-hmm. And and Watkins is of a similar speed to Vardy. You know, he can make those runs. So that certainly gives you another option. Yeah. Yeah. Jarby's good at sort of bending his runs as well, isn't he? So that, that, that's the thing that we're all quite, quite excited about. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, just I know we 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 are borrowing your time for for, for uh, this morning because I know you you're very very busy. Um, but I know all Villa fans you know want to see want to hear about potential incomings. Um, and this way maybe where Monchi will come into his own in terms of his contacts. Um, you know, Ollie Watkins you've just mentioned there being our kind of main striker. Obviously, Art Cameron Archer. There's high hopes for him. John Duran's that little bit raw. Um, Villa fans a little bit worried about that striker position. Um, you know, where is this where Monchi comes in and utilizes some of his contacts? Ferran Torres linked. Um, and are Villa looking to to do more in the transfer market? I think they definitely are, yeah. I think the issue with central strikers, every window, everyone wants one. And yeah, <laughs> there's not that many who you can afford, and not not Aston Villa, but any club, but a club can afford who's immediately gonna make their team better. Um, there's a there's a handful in the world, and with the Saudi Pro League's involvement, it just it throws another obstacle in there with regard to signing these players. Um, one I would think is worth keeping an eye on is is Joao Felix. Um, I don't think Aston Villa will be his first choice. Um, I'm sure he'll probably get offers from the Saudi Pro League, but certain the time comes when you have to realise: look, do I do I want to play? Or do I just want to pick up my money? And he's clearly not part of it, Atletico Madrid. Um, I can't think it's one that's going to happen in the next 24, 48 hours. But, you know, if by the start of the season he's not in squads, he's not anywhere, there's no other offers for him, that would be one that I think will be worth keeping in mind, I think. Yeah, yeah. and I guess slight other, other ones would be the right back position, I think Villa fans are kind of talking that Matty Cash has actually done really well in pre-season, uh, to be honest. And there's that the option of Ezri Consa going out there, maybe even a Callum Chambers, but that right back position and 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 the, the kind of substitute goalkeeper, because I, I don't know, you know, even Robin Olsen has done OK in pre-season, but there, there's a concern there. You know, Martin has been such a, a wonderful goalkeeper that it's it's a it's a it's a downgrade whoever goes in but yeah. you know a potential considerable downgrade you know without what too see, much shade at him what you'll see this season i may be completely wrong but just from from what i understand the back four will probably have one offensive fullback so let's say for argument's sake it's alex moreno and if it's alex moreno then the right back so called would be consa and yeah. Moreno will push forward and you leave a kind of three there in defence. If you've got Cash as the attacker, let's say attacking fullback, then the left back, so called, will be Torres. I think that's something that they've been working on, and they'll be looking at. Um, where that leaves Luca Dean, I'm not sure. Um, I think, you know, he's another who's a target for the Saudi Pro League. His people are very vociferous, you know, to the extent of calling me out on social media when they said that Aston Villa, you know, would be open to offers for him. I, I, I do think that's the case. Um, but he's he's very well paid, um, and he's still got quite some time in his contract. It's not an easy deal yeah. to do, but I do think if that's if that's one they could move on with a view to moving someone else in, they certainly would. So yeah, okay. So so do you think without obviously we can't guarantee anything, but do you think Villa fans can can still be interested in this market? Because traditionally Villa have particularly last season we did most of our main business early. There was there was right towards the end, then Dunker and obviously Bender. Yeah. And Kane. But um, do you think there still potentially could be a for sure, of absolutely for sure, yeah. And I think the the outgoing market is one that needs to be sorted, and this is what always holds things up, especially yeah. with the restrictions of financial fair play in this window that have become more and more prevalent. Um, and that's why you need to be a bit careful. You need to be careful to clear your decks before you get anyone else in. So people like you know Coutinho, Ndonka, Dean. Um, there's other players that, you know, they they would 
listen to offers for, I'm sure. And that, I think, is the priority now before you start bringing others in. But who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Well, obviously, Coutinho has actually really done well in pre-season, particularly those last couple of games and, and may play a part in the early season and then, you know, obviously potentially move on. But you talk FFP there. Uh, we had, did have a, a viewer question around the FFP and trying to balance our books. And it seems like, you know, the the really high level clubs, the PSGs, the Man Cities and stuff seem to be able to circumvent it a little bit more than, say, a Villa. But obviously they bring in wonderful amount, of, you know, really high amounts of money. But, you know, there's talk of Aaron Ramsey uh, going to Burnley. Uh, I, th- I believe it's around 12 million or it may be in excess of 12 million now. But obviously that's going to do a lot for FFP. Yeah, and I think what you see, like, and, and I do have to run, so if we can make this yeah. the last one, that'd be great. What what you see is that clubs are now thinking more and more about FFP than ever before. The, the canary in the mine, if you want, I think, is Everton. And clubs are all waiting to see if Everton are going to be punished and if they are punished, what the punishment will be. Um, they may not be. But that's making everybody nervous, I think. And the way that clubs are now looking at their homegrown players, which is a shame because you want your homegrown players to become your stars, don't you? They look at them as they're absolute golden for FFP because they didn't cost anything. So you sell them, it's just profit. Like Leicester with Harvey Barnes, classic example. That's all profit. That's why Nottingham Forest are happy to sell Brennan Johnson. It's all profit. And and Aaron Ramsey would come into that category for sure. So I think, um, you know, Chuck Omeka would have been another one. Yeah. Um, so I think Obviously that's Jack. Yeah, and and that's where Villa are quite well set up because they, you know, the work of the academy in the last few years has been superb. And there's players there who you can sell for, you know, look at there's probably the equivalent of say Ryan Giles at Wolves, you know, they got five million for proven in the championship. That's quite handy for FFP. And there's quite a lot of players at Villa who who would fulfill that category. So I think, you know, I think they'll be okay. Famous last words. Cool. Yeah, yeah, brilliant, brilliant. But yeah. obviously, thank you so much for your time, Tom. Pleasure, guys. To, to, uh, just where people, where can people find you on Twitter? Because you seem to be the man in the know these days with Villa. No, I don't know um, about that. But people, hang on, um, hang on to your word, mate. Yeah, I don't know about that, but it's at Tom Colomossi. Tom, brilliant. Tom, you need you need to get a Fabrizio Romano type uh, tagline like "Here we yeah, go." Yeah. <laughs> you need to think. think yeah, maybe you could think of one. Yeah. Yeah. Stop yeah. right there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. That's a good one. Right, yeah. Tom. Thank you so much, mate. Uh, we'll, we'll catch up soon. Cheers, Take man. Care, lads. Thank you. Thanks Bye, very mate. much. Bye-bye. Bye. Fantastic, mate. There we go. From uh, straight from the the horse's mouth, so to speak. You know, lots of great new, great information about the background of the club, um, how we do our, how we've done some of our dealings, and potential. You know, what what we could be looking forward to. Uh, in the transfer market, but we've got to watch the outgoings too at, at the minute. Yeah, I think I think all all Villa fans want to look at the opportunity we've got this season. You know, look at look at the finish last season. Some of the bigger teams that have dropped off a little bit, and I think we all see that that chance to to push on a little bit. And we know there's a couple of question marks still over the team, and we know there's a couple of areas which, which could hurt us. We talked about it on the pods a lot lately. If we don't strengthen. But it's not always as simple as it as just clicking your fingers and bringing in a, you know, a, a reserve striker. And and the point around that he makes is absolutely bang on because it's not only that. Obviously, it's the hardest role to fill it globally. Look at Tottenham situation, right? If they bring in, sorry, if they sell Harry Kane, they're going to have to bring in a striker that's going to clearly need to be a first choice striker. They're all looking for a striker to not really be a first choice striker. So you're basically saying. Um, um, I needed a new player, but not as good as my usual player, who's happy to come, happy to be seen as, as, as sort of sec- sec- second best. And it's, it's just not easy. The other thing is, is which we don't always see, is how easy is it to get rid of some of these players? How much do they need to get rid of some of these players? Maybe there's a deal lined up for someone, but we've got to get rid of a, a, a Carlos or a Coutinho or a Bailey, some of these rumours. So it's... I think the key thing for me is to know that we are still active if we need to be. And I think that's um, that's reassuring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, fantastic chat with Tom. Um, and, you know, he, he gave us his time there. We've we've been we've been sort of going back and forth to negotiate, but he's just had so many things on with Tom Brady going into as a shareholder in Birmingham City to the Wolves situation today, like to, to put it to give his time is uh, is a lot for, for us, Kev, isn't it? And really yeah. appreciate him coming on. 
Yeah, and of course, championship season, season started as well. So, you know, obviously the big derby, Leicester, Leicester Carve, the M69 derby the other day. So he's been been really busy. So, yeah, it's, it's always good to um, to get people people on the, on the channel that can obviously add, add some, some real quality. So, yeah, that was great to have him. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Well, guys, thank you very, very much for watching. Um, as I said before, we're on the road to 3K. So please hit that like button. Please hit that subscribe button. We'll be back with plenty more content this week because it's the big kickoff and we have a, a certain preview for uh, Aston Villa Newcastle to come up and uh, obviously a match reaction. Hopefully a happy match reaction. It doesn't happen very often at St. James's Park, but hopefully we'll be back with that. Um, even more transfer talk if we get any more rumours. Um, so please, please stick with the channel. And as always, remember, we all follow the Villa. Thanks, everyone. Up and running and Villa 1 is loud. Yeah.